welcome to the 11th episode of the 6th season of the Ubuntu podcast. It's Wednesday the 8th of May and in this episode we're going to discuss what's been in the news. We'll also talk about the latest happenings in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Laura and joining me this week are Mark. Hello. Alan. Hello. And Tony. Hiya. Hiya. <laughs> There's always one. And uh, just to forewarn everybody, I have a bit of a uh, bit of a cough, so I sound even sexier than normal. <laughs> oh, I, I'll week. try and control myself. Yes, hold yourself <laughs> down, everyone. <laughs> so, um, let's get on with the show. Now it's time for the news. Valve has released a beta of Portal, the popular first-person tutor come physics puzzler for Linux. So Ooh. this like, how old is this game? Yeah, it's quite old. <laughs> yeah. yeah but I've been waiting six years to have a go at it. Oh, you should have said when you were at my house, I could have... No. Like, no? Uh, okay. Yeah. Why is it well, only a beta? Because it's not... Well, this is... It's a, it's a Source Engine game, um, which is the the... Um, engine, engine, which <laughs> things like Half Life and uh, Left 4 Dead, which was one of the first games they got to run on Linux, were uh, uses words, words. But it's a different version of the Source Engine to what the other games. It's used. basically because they've just ported it across, yeah, right, and it's not perfect. They got and, to fix all the little, and there bits are and bobs. there are a few little issues with it, like some of the textures don't look right on certain video cards and stuff. So. It's not. It's not finished yet. So, if say I spent, have just spent five minutes downloading Steam for free from the Ubuntu software store <laughs> yeah. thing, um, can I then just download and install the beta? No, only mm. if you already own um, a copy of Portal, which you could buy. But okay, you, you can't. You can't go if you're a Linux user who doesn't own a copy of Portal. You can't go to Steam on Linux and buy portal to get access to the beta but you could just buy a copy oh you'd have to buy it on windows yeah you have to buy it on windows or install steam under wine and buy it through that can you not just go to game or you can you can wait until it comes out properly because it's only a beta at the moment right okay. wait until it comes out properly and then you can and it being a six-year-old game will it run on my six-year-old laptop yes i don't I, they're not going to be doing any like updates to the graphics and stuff will they as long as it would have supported it when the game came out i don't yeah. know <laughs> yeah what does it need? It's not that challenging in no. terms of hardware resources. And it's got all the necessary stuff to... You can dial the resolution down yeah. and dial the detail down if, you, if, you know, if you've got a really rubbish You basically card. just need something which supports 3D hardware acceleration. It, it is one of those games that you know people have been harping on about for ages. I wish I could play Portal on Linux natively. And, you know, and, and now it's finally here. <laughs> Kind of a bit of an anticlimax, <laughs> well, but we, it's a good anticlimax. And it's a really fun game. If you haven't it played is. it, you really. My ought kids to. love watching me play Portal and Portal Two. Yeah, I always it's thought it looked really cool. It is. And it was just an interesting idea, and yeah. never got to play it. Well, A. Hazen is listening live and is talking to people in the IRC channel, and he can verify the fact that there are some graphics glitches in the beta ah. because he can see through the walls. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that makes it interesting. Yeah, yeah, but walking into the glass walls, I guess. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's always it's got the little beta sticker on it, you know, like everything, from like Google. everything these days. So, <laughs> but it's it's, it a, right. it's a good game, and I, you know, I I will be happy when it comes out because um, it's You're yeah, easily it's pleased. yeah. Well, no, because I've already bought the game, yeah. um, which I bought in a bundle, and that's the <laughs> other thing is a lot of people already have the game. Yeah, it, a lot of people who had Steam for a long time have already got Portal because they bought it with. Um, a bundle the like box. the Orange Box, yeah. which came with like five or six games, Portal being one of them, and so loads of people have already got it, or they got a code for it when they bought something else. You know, uh, it was given, yeah. it was a, it was one of those things to try and get people to get Steam, mm. um, because once they once you've got Steam, it's very easy for you to spend more money on Steam. <laughs> it's very much like the whole iTunes thing. Once once your credit card is in iTunes, once so your credit card is in Amazon, it's very easy for you to then. Buy stuff. Buy it now. Exactly. Mm. One click buying and all that. Mm. It's not quite one click with Steam, but it's um, it's it's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> and you can pay with PayPal as well. Yeah. <gasps> it's dangerous. That's dangerous. Because that, yeah. that's not even real money. No, exactly. <laughs> that's wife don't know money. Exactly. <laughs> oh dear. 
Um, well, she do now. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't listen. Don't worry. <laughs> yes, I don't think nobody would ever possibly tweet at the real Popey. And, uh, tell <laughs> no, her nobody about would that. do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> She'll get spun now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's good news for Debian, the parent distro, if you like, of Ubuntu, the distro that Ubuntu was forked from or is uh, <laughs> uh, 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 create, created downstream. From uh, Debian, the very popular Linux distro, uh, has had its seventh version released, codenamed Wheezy, after a, an asthmatic penguin in the Toy Story films. Uh, it's not asthmatic, is he? I thought he just had, he had a dust because we were sat on the top shelf. Uh, uh, okay. His uh, squeaker didn't work. But yeah, yeah, squeaker I, didn't I, work. I think... He was on the top shelf and the dust got in. and Aww. Yeah, because they, they fixed it at the end. They fixed it. And, uh, okay. uh, he could sing. He sang the outro, didn't he? It's a nice kid's he film. He had a deep anyway. voice at the end. Yeah. Yeah. It's Don't we all? Not a kid's film at all. Um, anyway, the Debian In the release... the way Harry Potter is a kid's book. <laughs> that's just your way of justifying the fact that you've got them all. Exactly. So have you. So anyway, no, Debian. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Debian 7 includes a new installer, support for UEFI, <laughs> and the ability to install both 32 and 64-bit applications on the same system. Just oh, like Ubuntu. That would be multi-arch, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah, so how does this differ from the ability to install 32-bit applications on a 64-bit system that we have at the moment? Uh, we as in Ubuntu or yes. we as in Debian previously to Wheezy? I can install some 32-bit apps on my Ubuntu system. Yeah, you've been able to do that for a while. Okay. Um, but the the difference with multi-arch, it's not just Intel as well, multi-arch across other architectures as well. So there's 32 oh, yeah. and 64-bit ARM as well. Right. Um, but the idea is that you don't need to have... Um, you you can very easily install, say, a, a 64-bit operating system and have a nice mixture of 64-bit and 32-bit apps, and you don't have to install this horrible great big blob of um, libraries called IA32libs. You just install yes. the individual 32-bit libraries that are needed by the 32-bit app. Yeah, so it's a more is, fine-grained um, support. Then. Yes, and it's more robust, and um, it's um, better for bug fixing as well because you you fix bugs in the individual libraries that have the problem, not this gigantic IA32 libs blob thing. Cool. Well, they support nine architectures with this new release, yeah. which is pretty impressive. Mm. It um, is. Although I think it's possibly down from their peak. I think they're probably supporting more at some point in the past. Yeah, I guess some things have died out um, at Mips some point. Mips or something, maybe. No, I think Mips is still there. It's okay. um, things like, you know, Amiga and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> that you know. Yes. But there's a live CD, so if you want to give it a go and try it out, you can do. Mm. And uh, if you've tried Worth Debian doing. and have any feedback, you can let us know. And we'll be interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> Promise. <laughs> Android and Google have contributed improvements to FreeType, which is the font rendering technology that's used on both Linux and Android systems. And the technology will enable the use of CFF fonts, which have been available on Windows and OS X for years. So is this another font format to yes. go with TrueType and WAF and OpenType and all of the others? Wasn't FreeType meant to replace TrueType but be free? <sighs> Who knows? But what's good about this this type of type? <laughs> there, are, there are gifs of it. <laughs> <laughs> It's very high quality, so it's it's designed for high resolution displays, right. or, or can cope better with the high resolution ah. displays, the so called retina displays. Better for reading. Okay, yeah. so things like the Google Pixel thing that has very high resolution yes. display, and the Apple Mac MacBook book thing, and the iPad three. Laura's this does. No, yeah. Yeah. Laura's Nexus My Nexus 10. ten. Yeah, so that's only a ten eighty p though. That's not really that no, high. No, that's <laughs> higher than. Oh, that's the just iPad higher, one. isn't it? Yeah. Oh, get you. This is <laughs> this is higher resolution than an iPad four. Is it? Have you know? Oh well. So um, it's all about the uh, the Hi. readability of these fonts on these sort of displays yeah. and making them look a lot more like a quote unquote you know real paper printed printed paper. So Not it's the right. high resolution stuff. Um, so it's a good thing that we're going to get hold of them yeah. and hopefully it will make those applications even better. Mm. Hinting is the word they use a lot. Okay. I know nothing about fonts. Uh, <laughs> and now you know even less. Yeah, super. Uh, in other news, the Queen of England and other regions has... <laughs> and her Commonwealth. <laughs> yeah, and her Commonwealth and our Commonwealth, whoever. The Queen has shown off how hard she's been studying for her Cisco CCNA exam in her speech to Parliament today. In relation to the problem of matching internet protocol addresses, my government will bring forward proposals to enable the protection of the public 
and the investigation of crime in cyberspace. So, in cyberspace. So what exactly is, what is the problem of matching internet protocol addresses? <laughs> well, I guess, you know, you, you, it's difficult to know for sure who's the human being behind, who are the people who are accountable when you're talking about laws yes. behind an protocol address uh, that's been dished out by an ISP um, or exactly. company. So, you know, uh, I could have, for example, looked through the window of Tony and Laura's house and seen the uh, QR code, which gives me access to their Wi-Fi network. Yeah. Mm. And I could have taken a photo of that while they were away on holiday yes. and got access to their network and done unspeakable things on their <laughs> network. And very, very slowly. Like downloading. <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> slowly, yes. Uh, downloading images, you know, like from the past. Mm. Um, and they could potentially be liable. Like images of Darwin? And... No, I mean, like, slowly appearing on the screen line by line due to your slow internet. Um, and, yeah, you could potentially be viable cause it, liable because it's your network, your IP address. So um, do you think that this is it. talking about making sure that innocent people don't get wrongly done when someone steals their Wi-Fi? Or do you think it's more talking about making it so that um, there's a better way of working out an IP address that was... Um, you know, automatically assigned by an ISP. There's records of who it was assigned to and when. Yes, I do. Yes, yes. Mm. I think it's more about the, the auditability. Yes. Yeah, because I, I, I would like to have uh, like the Queen to have explained how IPv6 <laughs> and IPv4 are going to coexist um, in terms of this legislation. Yeah, uh, I would have given a yeah. small amount of her own money back to her. I'd have liked to have heard us explain the difference between 32 and 64 a bit. Oh, fine, thanks. I think it's quite cool. <laughs> bit like, bit like explaining the off offside rule. Yeah, so it's it was interesting for her to actually use a technical term like that. I'm not sure that was what cyberspace. Super, well, <laughs> she was one step away I, from the information superhighway. It was. Yes, wasn't it? It, was. Yeah. it was a little bit cringe making, but you know, this sounds like there's going to be some type of consultancy mm. or. Um, Bill brought in to something for the open rights group to protest about. Yeah, least. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we got to keep them occupied. Yeah, <laughs> they have, they are happy because they, there was a worry that there there was going to be talk of the communications data bill, or as it's been termed, the snoopers <laughs> charter, which is uh, there was worry that that was going to yeah. introduce you know more surveillance powers. Well, we the other the other flip side of it is if you're trying to be helpful and you run something like a Tor exit node yeah. where traffic leaves your network um, having been encrypted and sent over the internet from places that you don't know, you know, mm -hmm. maybe people who are stuck in repressive regimes like, you know, Syria or maybe some other countries and you don't know what that traffic is and yeah. you don't necessarily want to know, but you're responsible because it's your IP address. Mm -hmm. Um and whether, you know, that's going to make it harder for people to run things like Tor exit nodes. Um, but that's all we mm, can mm. see, really. Yes, interesting point. And there's a final piece of news, which Alan is very pleased about. Yes. Which is that the German game publisher UIG has announced that the Kickstarter-backed Leisure Suit Larry remake will be available cross-platform in June, retailing at £15.20 or £15 or $20 on Windows, Mac and Linux. And it's about nine bucks on iOS and Android. Now, I vaguely remember Leisure Suit Larry existing when I was very little, but it's quite an old game. It is very old. It's one of the old uh, point-and-click adventure games yeah. from Sierra um, in the same vein as um, Police King, Quest, Police King's Quest, Quest, King's Quest. Quest. Yeah, all yeah. of those. What's its theme? Uh, so you're a guy, uh, Leisure Suit Larry, and you're looking for love i think <laughs> i think the game was literally larry in the land of the lounges was the first one um but yeah the whole theme of it is you know you're looking for love and success in however you measure those things <laughs> looking for love is is a soft version i think of what is actually well, showing that's actually on the what screen one of them was called <laughs> one of them was called looking for love um but it was this point and click adventure where you know you you have to try and navigate your way around by <laughs> clicking on things, picking things up and going to different locations and stuff. And it was, it was pretty revolutionary and fun and adult themed, um, which was a bit different and it was mainstream as well. You know, it was, it was a kind of game that wasn't just relegated to, you know, kids playing it. You know, it was, uh, I remember my, my very first job in, uh, <laughs> was playing games. <laughs> no, in 19, I think 80, 
eight or 1990 thereabouts i i remember uh going into the building maintenance guy's office to ask him to do something and he was sat there playing leisure suit larry on a pc and um yeah we didn't have particularly powerful pcs at the time you know these are you know, not even two eight sixes, and it would run off of I think three floppy disks. <laughs> on uh, and you know, at a certain point in the game, you had to change floppy disk or yeah. something. Yeah, it was, it was it was this was a long time ago. But there are enough people on Kickstarter who enjoyed the game that much that they backed it to bring it back to life again. And the so, will it. we still have to use three floppy disks? <laughs> oh, I hope so. Nostalgia. Yes. Sake. Yes. You could, if you don't have floppy drives, maybe you could spread it across three USB keys and swap <laughs> them. Forward. Record it onto an audio cassette tape. Yes, that would be good. Well, thank you for that retro, dirty old man experience. <laughs> <laughs> anytime, Tony. Anytime. <laughs> The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that entertains, engages, or enrages you, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Please do get in touch. I mean it. Just one message. Just to know there's someone out there who cares. And now it's time for the community news. Including events. Yeah, and events. Uh, so first up, we've got Timo Yurinki has blogged about uh, some of the work he's been doing over the last few months, packaging up Qt 5 for Ubuntu. Okay, so Qt 5 is what? Is a graphics programming toolkit development toolkit it's a toolkit and previously in the previous release of ubuntu we had Qt 4 and upstream um well it used to be nokia yes. and cute uh, ownership was taken over by a company called digia i think um and they over the last few months have released uh betas and release candidates and then finally Qt 5 came out and um Timo's been working very hard in keeping the packages up to date in um, Ubuntu 13.04 rearing. So the Ubuntu Touch SDK is based on Qt 5, isn't it? Yeah, so it was Qt 4, and then towards the end of last year, before it all went public, it was migrated across to Qt 5. Yeah. Um, and um, I think they were on Qt 5 beta, and uh, and so after that, um, after the demos, it, it all moved on to mm. the Qt 5 proper release. But one of the things I'm most pleased about is the work that Timo had done. He's upstreamed to Debian. So, you know, everyone gets the benefit of cool. having decent packaging of upstream Qt 5 in Debian and all the other derivative distributions that want to use Qt as well. So will Timo's work help those who want to develop apps for Ubuntu Mobile? Yeah, because actually he also works closely with the SDK team um, in Canonical. So he's been working hard on uh, making sure all of that works together and getting packages for Qt Creator and all the other Qt Creator related bits. Uh, so he maintains a PPA. There's a, there's a website, uh, developer.ubuntu.com, and uh, there's some instructions there that let you install the SDK and it pulls in a load of packages that, that Timo maintains. Um, he's done a load of good work, so I just wanted to call that out. Well, good for Timo. Well mm. done. Thank you very much. And Ask Ubuntu, the web-based question and answer thing, help. <laughs> What's the name of Stack Exchange? The yes, sort of Stack Exchange the type site for Ubuntu has reached a milestone. 100,000 questions have been asked about Ubuntu. And most of them have been answered. Mm. 75% are, of them. Indeed. That's pretty good going, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. There are about 25,000 questions that are unanswered, which is... You know, the flip side of that coin. Well, yes. But they might not, you know, not, well, some not of everyone them, asks questions in a way that makes them easy to answer. And some of them aren't questions. They're, um, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of like... I just did this, I'm pasting it here so I can remember. <laughs> well, sort of thing. not so much. They're kind of like, you know, what's the best game, you know. It's it's oh, not subjective it, things. Yeah, yeah, subjective things that aren't really, you know, my wireless card is broken, how do I fix it? Kind of problems, which is what Ask Ubuntu is really aimed at. Mm. Um I, I love Ask Ubuntu. It's it's just the fact that you can ask a question, you know, from from nothing. You can ask a question and it'll go and automatically search for other people who've asked that question. 
you tag yeah. the question with things like, you know, if it's your wireless card, you type wireless in there and it'll go and find questions related to wireless. So it'll try and help you solve the problem without you actually having to type the full question out. And then if it, if there isn't already a question in there, you know, you put in some details. But the really cool thing is other people will come along and edit your question for readability. So if you just put in a, you know, a stream of consciousness in the question, someone else will come along and format it and change all the commands to be in um, monospace, uh, monospace yeah. font and um, change hyperlinks so they're, they're more meaningful and insert screenshots and stuff like that. And that's even before you've got an answer. They edit the question for readability first. Mm. And then other people will come along and give you answers. And Others will rate those up and down. And the really good thing that I really like about it is the really rubbish answers get rated down. Yeah. People downvote the rubbish. And if you find a question that's been answered, you get the question and then the answer, and you don't have to see anything else. Yeah. You see the, the, the right answer, answer that everyone right else has said. Yeah. Solves yeah. all the forum problems exactly. you used exactly. to hate. Exactly. Yeah, totally. And, and when I go back to using a forum, it's just the pain of seeing... Or, or even something like Google Communities, I just tear my hair out because on Google Communities, someone will ask a question, at, you know, like three o'clock in the morning when I'm not around and there's nobody else looking at it, and then three or four people will leave answers that are absolutely mental, completely <laughs> wrong, and oh, you should install this or you should switch to Mint or so, you know that, <laughs> that don't answer the question in any way, shape, or reasonable form. There's somebody wrong on the internet. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's my problem. I but know. you also get somebody answers the question really confidently, and you're like, oh, that's the answer. And then if you read three posts down, you realise they were wrong yeah. and you've already done the thing that yes. they said to do. Yeah, that's the problem. With, that's the other problem with forms is you have to read every single answer, all 25 pages. Because you on... can't skip to the end because you don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, I've tried that. I've tried skipping to page 25 and then going, OK, can I get the gist if I go back to 23? <laughs> <laughs> what if I go back to 20? Will I get it there? Split like, the difference. No, just go to the beginning and read the whole lot. And I just can't be doing with that. Yeah. That's why I love Ask Ubuntu. Well, Nero is listening live and commenting in the IRC channel, and he agrees. He says that uh, Ask Ubuntu is definitely more useful to him than forums, uh, at least for finding solutions to problems. Cool. Which is really why they're there. Exactly. Yeah. Just job done. Mm. We have a new code name for 1310, mm. and it is Saucy Salamander. Yeah, it's not a saucy sure? sauce pot that I wrote earlier. <laughs> no, I edited that. Oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, saucy salamander. Salamander's a kind of lizard, isn't it? Yeah. I think so. And saucy is kind of ketchup and that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it came quite it's late. A, it's um, a lizard covered in ketchup. It's one of the latest announcements yeah, of, it was, of name. It wasn't until we've had. The, the release of wearing. Yeah. It, we, and uh, usually it's. it's Because um, one of the problems is not having a name. We can't open the it. archive <laughs> for people to start oh, yeah. working on the next oh. version. And, you know, if you've finished raring and you're ready to go. Raring, raring to, to go. go. Yeah, there we are. Uh, with, with the next release, you're you know, champing at the bit trying to get uh, stuff done. So, you know, as soon as uh, Mark had announced it, that was it. Colin Watson and members of the release team and, and so on were uh, configuring Launchpad for all the the milestones and other bits and bobs they need to set up it's it's quite a bit of work to actually set up even though you know they've done it how many times like 13 times it's quite a bit of work to set up do you mean it's not scripted not all of it uh mm. if you want to try replacing colin watson with a script uh good luck with that okay i was trying to think of other cold-blooded animals covered in in sauce or you know like a, a gecko covered in gravy or a gra gra gravy gecko. A gravy gecko. <laughs> that would be a good one. Gecko would no, be quite wouldn't. cool. I think no, we should take no, take our lead from the uh, the beefy miracle people and have food <laughs> slash cold blooded animal as our naming convention. <laughs> Not to be okay. too specific. So if you have uh, food and cold blooded animal, you think we should use uh, creamy chameleon? Don't email us. <laughs> <laughs> if you. <laughs> User experience designer Callum Pringle has posted guidelines about how Ubuntu Touch apps should respond to orientation of devices. So this mm. is things like when you're switching your tablet. I was about to do it with my laptop, dear me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to On you an rotating audio your podcast. laptop. So this is, yeah, to demonstrate to all of you listeners exactly what we mean. Um, yeah, yeah about switching, nobody knows what rotation means. Mm -hmm. About switching a tablet from portrait to landscape and how on and indeed phones and what should be the default on each. He's still murming it for you, listeners. Mm. So the, 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 yeah, the, the guidelines that he's posted suggest that um, an app, a phone app 
should um, default to being portrait and be landscape if it can, but a tablet app should be landscape by default, but portrait if it can. Mm. A very nice example of this that isn't Ubuntu but it's Android is Tweetcaster, which is a Never Twitter account, a Twitter client I use, and it's really cool because you pay for one app and it works on your phone and on your tablet. Um, but it does the whole re it just relays out everything. It's very cool and it's how all apps should be, I think. What when they rotate. Mm. Oh when they switch devices as well, screen sizes. Right. It just looks completely different, but it's the same app. Mm. So that's one thing that they they're they're building into the SDK is the is the transformation um yeah. when you move from one form factor to another. And this you know, the the vision that Mark talks about um being one app that scales from yeah. Well, any device um, they want to build that all in but give developers guidelines on how it should lay mm. out the screen and stuff the other cool thing about the the tablet apps that he talks about is how um because there's the is it called the side stage that's idea what it's on called a, yeah on a um so if you've got a, a tablet in landscape you can have um a sort of a third of the screen on the right with a portrait sort of phone form factor app running and so if you make your tablet app so that it works in landscape as well then it'll automatically sorry works in landscape and portrait then the portrait mode will be what appears in the side stage yeah so they, they've given a few use cases for that so for example on the left hand two thirds of the screen you might have a video playing and then the right hand one third of the screen you might have your twitter client mm. so you know for example watching doctor question who. time or doctor who <laughs> you could apprentice. be like tweeting while you're doing it or something or yeah. you know um, or you could have like um you could have like a, a video chat or an im conversation and a document that yeah. you're editing while you're working on. Yeah, there's, like loads, of, there's loads of scenarios where this kind of thing works. Like, um, and a lot of them are where you would use a slim application, which was designed for the phone, but would um, mm. work quite as well on the on the tablet, but in a vertical. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got a new PPA set up uh, <laughs> called the Collections PPA uh, for people using Ubuntu. Uh, Ubuntu Touch Preview on phones and tablets. And what do the collections collect? Uh, apps that people have created, apps and games. So basically, we've got we've got the core apps project that we talked to Michael Hall about, yeah. and the core apps project has got um, the the main apps that we identified might be useful. You know, on on uh, the initial sort get of go. blessed ones. Well, they're not really. Well, yeah, kind of, um, <laughs> <laughs> but. Other people have gone out and created their own apps. So, you know, people have written games and applications. And they're they're all over the place. You know, they're in GitHub or they're in uh, Launchpad or someone's made a YouTube video of it. And we thought, wouldn't it be good if people could actually use them on their device? So we reached out to all the developers and got the code. And uh, myself and Michael and Ken Van Dyne and a few others have been packaging these up and putting them in a PPA so that you can very easily install them on a phone or a tablet. So do you do um, add app, app, app repository on yeah, your phone? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've also written a little script, um, which um, I'll, I'll try and put, <laughs> remember to put a link to, and the script will back up your directory on the phone, mm. flash the phone to the latest image, because we do a daily image, yeah. then restore all your data, yeah. so things like your cookies and, and all that kind of stuff, and then install, add the PPAs, and then install all of those apps and, and games and stuff. So you get more than just what oh, you get on right, the image. That's cool. Um, so Stuart Language is Dropping Letters game, which is really popular. Yes. That's on there. There's a same game. There's a basic shoot 'em up game and a whole load of other stuff. It's really cool. cool. And finally, Colin Watson has announced that the entire Debian packaging system that runs Ubuntu is going to be thrown out <laughs> and replaced with a series of small Python scripts. Oh, Tony, you big troll. That's what I read on the internet. <laughs> so it must be right. Uh, yeah. It's not actually correct. Um, so what Colin is talking about is a, an, a, a packaging system that will sit alongside the existing Ubuntu packaging system for the desktop um, and will enable applications to run uh, without being uh, need the need to run the installation package as root and that will have a potential to be sandboxed and restricted mm. to run in one place in the system, which is obviously very useful for things like mobile apps. Yeah, it's good. It's a rather lengthy, detailed post. It's worth a read. And um, yeah, they're still working on it. It's been talked about for ages, but it's finally coming to fruition. It's good. Cool. Yes, it's a small proof of concept at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. Hopefully we'll see some examples soon. Yep.
And that's all for this episode. Join us next time when we'll be interviewing Rick Spencer, VP of Ubuntu at Canonical. We'll be reading your feedback and we'll be making your life a bit easier with some command line love. Yes. Ooh, can't wait. Yes, Rick's a, a very important person. He runs a significant chunk of Canonical. He's responsible. Yeah. Yes, he does. And he's a really nice guy as well. That's good. That Fancy helps. That. Um, but yes, yeah, so we're going to ask him some very tough questions, I think. Are we? <laughs> yes. Oh, gosh. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.